released at the fort on Saturday night. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of recipes, one of which is my own cooking venison, and the other I got from Heather Schneider, who also had a discussion about taverns during the French and Indian War or the 18th century. So let's get this fire started, and then we'll go back and we'll talk about some of the other figures and the speakers that we had at School of the Law. So after Mike got done talking about tump lines, uh, we had a discussion with Mark Hersey. And Mark has been involved in studies of the 18th century for the last 20 years of his life. He's also a volunteer at Old Fort Niagara. And he's done a lot of different um, uh, seminars and things where he's offered his knowledge upon his research. And the individual that he spoke about was Simon Gurdy. So Simon Gurdy, who was he? Well, at one point, Mark had described the reputation of Simon Gertie as far as even going to Hollywood and was used in a quote in The Devil and Daniel Webster because he was supposedly a turncoat and they likened the defendant to Simon Gertie as being a turncoat. Well, who was Simon Gertie? Well, first of all, there's no known pictures of him. There's, you know, speculation and, and images that have been done uh, based upon descriptions. But Simon Gertie was born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 1742. At a very young age, he and his brother were captured by the Seneca. They lived with the Seneca until 1764 when he returned to Pittsburgh. This is a man that lived in two worlds, he had two different cultures, and he was a professional hunter. At one time, he even worked for George Morgan and his trade company. He was also known as a white savage. I guess Simon's disgrace was more or less known because of the burning of Crawford, in which a British officer was actually burned at the stake, and uh, he could not save him. And a lot of people had uh, attributed the execution to Simon not being able to do that and not doing his job. He also worked as uh, an interpreter for the U.S. Commission of Indian Affairs in Virginia. Why did this guy leave the employment of the Brits? Well, based upon testimony from family and friends, uh, even one person, Simon Murphy, said that Simon had become disheartened and he was bittered. He wasn't getting enough pay for the job that he was doing. He couldn't work anywhere, he didn't have any money, and he couldn't pay his bills, so he couldn't keep his farm up. Now a little backstory with Simon. Simon between the years 1778 and 1795, he was <clears throat> employed by the Brits. He also made 10 shillings a day, but he made that in continental money. And continental money at the time, as we know, was not worth what British sterling was or the British pound. So consummate to his duties as being an interpreter, okay, he was not paid the same amount of money that officers were paid for doing less of a job.
We're talking about an individual that was trusted by the Indians. He spoke a definite six Indian languages. He spoke Seneca. He spoke Onondaga. He spoke Mingo. He spoke Algonquin. He spoke Delaware. He spoke Shawnee. That's six that were definitely known of. He possibly spoke up to nine languages totally. In 1780, he was made a war party captain, and he traveled with eight to 20 braves at any given time during his duties as a scout and interpreter, uh, whatever the need be. By 1781, he had 120 warriors underneath him, more than any other white uh, frontiersman or white uh, interpreter and or scout. Simon had a tormented life and at his time of death in 1818 in Canada, near Malden, Canada, he actually had a bounty on his head. That bounty was obviously never collected because he died peacefully at home. So Mark went into a lot of history about Simon and brought up some good points and why he should not be just labeled as a traitor. I mean, it's, it's apparent to me that if you really wanted to look at it, I liken him to a baseball player at today's age. He went to where the money is. And can you blame him? If the guy wanted to have a farm and he wanted to provide for his family, you know, and the British weren't doing it, well, at that particular point in time, why not? Why not go over there? Anyway, it's a story that, uh, that deserves, you know, more of a look and don't just look at the, you know, the typical, this guy was a traitor, there's probably reasons why. I'm not saying whether they're good or bad, but it was a very interesting discussion, and it made me think, and it's a character that sooner or later I'm probably going to research a little bit more. <laughs> got a little shot of the food that's going to the feast tonight. Yeah. What we got cooking here? So it's a cream of mushroom soup with chicken and rice, and uh, it ended up kind of soupy. But nice. it's re it tastes really good. Still looking good. Yep. Right, so I do apologize for the, the length of time in between the shadow and the porridge, but you know, this, the winter time was a time for reflection on getting new things and new items to actually bring you something that's a little bit more accurate. And a few of the things that I got here right now are some of the cookware and things that were actually brought to the station camp or carried by a long hunter or his company of men, or things that were used in the home. Uh, if you remember, they have to actually cook in their hearth, and that's what some of these things are actually designed for. So, the first thing that I want to go over is I want to go over two different types of frying pans. And we have this pan here, which is a folding skillet, which actually reduces the amount of space that it takes in your uh, pack, your snap sack, your, uh, your bed roll, or however you wish to carry this. This one was hand forged uh, by a friend of mine, Chris Wick, who actually did the entire thing through forging. Uh, and it's come in readily quite handy for me because I take this thing everywhere with me. For home use, or use around a large fire, we have this, which is known as a spider pan, because it has legs that are attached to the pan. This way you can put this in the hearth, or you can use it on a campfire. And this way it will stay extended above the fire. Chris also made this pan for me. This was like, I think the first pan, the first spider pan that he actually made. So I have the distinct pleasure of having that pan made for me, the first one that he ever did. I have a stainless steel bucket or corn boiler, which you have seen in previous videos, but I also had a friend of mine actually give me a tin boiler. The thing about tin is, is that it's soldered. All your joints are soldered. And you have to remember that you have to keep a lot of liquid in these, because if you don't, your solder is going to run, and then it's going to make your container useless. All right, It won't hold any substances until you get it resoldered and you fix the leaks. Now, I'm going to be using this, but I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not going to use it a lot. A friend of mine gave it to me, I don't want to destroy it, and it has a lot of sentimental value, so you're probably going to see this thing in steel. 
okay? As far as my own drinking vessels, I have a simple tin cup, which could have been readily carried by anybody. And I also have a nice wooden noggin cup. Right. I picked this one up uh, when I went to Fort Frederick to their trade fair. So, this is a nice little cup, fits well in your hand, and it's good for just dipping and drinking wherever you need. What we have here, this is nothing more than just a stand that you can put in the fire, you can put in your hearth. And again, you know, this would be used for a frying pan that you can use in the hearth as well, if you didn't have a spider pan. Cast iron cooking pot, very, very heavy. You wouldn't be carrying this on a trek, except for the fact that if you had a company of men, you could, each person takes a turn carrying this item while you're out there. Again, that can be used in the home or it can be used on the trail, depending upon who's carrying it, what you're carrying, and whether or not you're going to a location that can be there for a while, such as a fort or a station camp. See here, this is a large trade kettle. And again, this would not be uncommon for a company of men to carry at least one large vessel for cooking. This way, this could be packed with uh, flour and other types of foodstuffs that you may have. And again, each person would take a turn while carrying this. If you were out on your own, though, you know, a small trade kettle would be fine for use on the trail. And actually, what I wind up doing is I usually carry something like this and this frying pan and my cup and I'm actually pretty good to go. So those are some of the new things that I got for cooking uh, when we discuss the, the actual recipes that we're going to be doing in this series. So what we're going to do is we're going to start and we're going to have venison, eggs, and we're going to have some bacon to go along with that. The bacon that we're going to use has been salt and pepper cured. And you can leave it out. It creates a rind around it. It does get moldy, but that's okay because it's already been cured. So all you have to do is you have to wipe the mold off, and then you can just slice it and cook it as normal. So the next person that spoke was Matt Wolf. And Matt has penned three books on the subject of Rogers Rangers. Matt's discussion was military campaigns on the frontier, and his uh, individual that he actually spoke about was Henry Bouquet and his march to Bushy Run. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So Matt's discussion, part of his seminar, was based upon military campaigns along the frontier. And what he focused on were, was Colonel Henry Bouquet's push westward towards Fort Duquesne. Put in chronological order, basically, Bouquet's defeats as well as his triumphs along the way and how he got to that fort. The first fort that he came to was Fort Bedford and Bedford was strategically placed and made because of its location for messaging up along the frontier, going back and forth, being able to have runners. The second fort they came into contact with was Fort Ligonier, and he was attached to the 77th Regular Highlanders that was under the control of Grant. He started with 850 men, and he wound up having 342 casualties along with Grant in that battle. So that took care of the morning. Um, towards the afternoon, we, we broke, we had lunch, and then what we did is we had a tavern talk by Heather Snyder. And she discussed different drinks that were popular in the time and, you know, how taverns were actually run in that time period. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to render this bacon because we want to get some fat in the pan. Now 
that's that nice thing about that spider pan because you can move it around and get it closer to the heat or move it farther away from the heat. As you can see, this is what the bacon looks like. Okay? It's pretty hard. And it will get a crust on it. But just remember that you can actually just, just take this, put a hole to it, put a thong on it, and you can hang it and then slice it off as you need it. It's completely cured, and all you need to do is just cut it and put it in the pan. Okay, so we have our bacon has been rendered down. And with venison, it doesn't have to be left on very long. And the only thing that I use is the salt that was in the bacon and the pepper as well to actually season that. One of the other things that you have is use the grease to your advantage. Roll the grease around in the pan. You don't have to spend a lot of time. You could actually take the grease and throw it up on top, and it'll help cook as well. Too. The venison's almost done. Of course, this is not like roasting a venison ham. Okay, but there is something that you have to do with this, same way as if you are cooking a ham. And you want to let your meat rest, okay? Just don't immediately cut into it because you're going to lose all the juice and all the flavor from the meat. So, we'll take this off. Okay, I got steak and bacon. I want to have eggs too. That one didn't turn out too good, but that's okay. I would say that's unlevel there, boys. Okay guys, okay guys, pretty much that's a pretty good feast right now. So we got venison, salt cured bacon, and we got some eggs. You know, pretty simple, not a lot to it, not a special recipe. It's just something that I've done, you know, time and time again. Uh, I'm sure it's no different than back then. And now I'm going to sit down, I'm going to have a feast. Don't go away though, because when I come back, I get done eating this, 
I'm going to show you how to make a typical 18th century recipe that I actually did get from the fort and I got it from Heather Schneider. So sit tight. So here we are and this is the line for the Friday night feast. I have big beans Which stretches all the way around. Jimmy got some food here. Got some more food. And Lisa's got some food. Lisa's happy. And me and Pat are just kind of hanging out and waiting. <laughs> Alright, so the next recipe. I uh, got this from Heather Schneider. She did a discussion on taverns, tavern drinks. Um, and she was actually a wonderful cook. So she actually shared a recipe with me. So after you have a feast, obviously you need to have some what type of What do we need dessert. for the rum soaked apricots? Well, obviously we need the apricots. We need a third of a stick of butter. We need some sugar. And of course, we need our rum. We also need water. Okay. You guys, we're gonna put some water in our frying pan. And we're gonna start to let that heat up. And then what we do is we're gonna take our apricots and we're gonna let them start to actually soak up the water and actually rehydrate. Because they are, for the most part, Uh, dry. We add our butter and we let that cook down as well. Now that we have the butter, for the most part, melted down, okay, add sugar. Okay, there's no real, there's no real measurement. Kind of doing it by taste and by eye as to what you have. What this is actually going to do is this is going to make like a syrup. And you're going to want to let it just reduce down. And as it's reducing, yeah, the apricots are going to soak up that moisture as well. Okay, hey guys, as we let this reduce down a little bit, this is where... You're gonna have a lot of fun. Oh. Hit that with the rum. Let your alcohol cook off. And that's what you want. <laughs> Take that off the fire now. Just let it cool. Essentially, it's almost like you're having hot buttered rum with apricots. And it's really good, guys. Really good.
So, and thanks to Heather Schneider on that recipe. It's cool and long hunter. I apologize for not having one of these videos out. But again, you know, life gets in the way. Research gets in the way. I don't just happen to, you know, watch other people's videos and then recreate this stuff. I actually go out and I actually practice this stuff. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of footage, and a lot of research to actually do these. So I, I thank you again for being patient. Uh, in the second part of uh, School of the Long Hunter, we're going to talk to Suzanne Larner, and we're going to talk to Mark Baker in reference to their seminars. So this is Brian from Snowwalker Bushcraft. Thank you for your views and your comments. And until the next episode of The Shadow in the Forest, go get your dirt on.